Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Al Saddleberger. I'm the Deputy Lab Director at Argonne. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to this special Director's Colloquium. Uh, we're welcoming back an old friend, Professor Sebastian Schmidt, uh, for an exposition, exploration of his research institution, the Forschungszentrum Julik. How did I do on that? FCJ for, for short. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about what our sister laboratories in this country are doing. Uh, but every now and then it makes sense to take a pause and look around the rest of the world and see how uh, the research enterprise in other countries is operating. Um, they obviously face the same questions that we face here in the United States. Uh, how do you encourage uh, multidisciplinary work between divisions? How do you keep the research consistently, if not constantly funded? Uh, how do you work effectively with industry? And how do you take discoveries in the laboratory and get over that valley of death and get them into the, uh, the marketplace? So FCJ is one of the largest uh, interdisciplinary research uh, centers in Europe with special expertise in nuclear and material science, nanotechnology and information technology, as well as biosciences and brain research. It's a member of the Helmholtz Association of German Research Centers, which as you probably know is the largest uh, scientific organization in Germany, and it's 70% publicly funded. Uh, like us, uh, here at Argonne, FCJ is surrounded by forest, has a synchrotron, uh, several supercomputers, and it's focused on solving grand challenge problems uh, in energy, environment, and information technology, among others. FCJ is also involved in a number of large-scale European science projects, such as the European Spallation Source and the Facility for Anti-Proton and Ion Research. Uh, we have a history of productive uh, collaborations with uh, FCJ. I understand in the 1980s, Argonne uh, Staff and uh, visiting physicist Peter Grunberg built some prototypes layering extremely thin slices of magnetic and non-magnetic -ma materials, which he then took back to Germany, continued to study, and discovered a phenomenon called giant magnetoresistance, which was uh, acknowledged uh, with the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2007. Uh, FCJ also combines fundamental science investigation with technological applications. And I'm very much looking forward to, to see how you uh, are doing it uh, now and uh, strategies and, and directions for the future. So I'm pleased to introduce Professor Sebastian Schmidt. Professor Schmidt is a member of the Board of Directors of FCJ and a professor of physics at RWTH Aachen University. Before that, he was the managing director and head of research for the Helmholtz Association. He studied at the University of Rostock and in Dubna, Russia, and was awarded his PhD in nuclear physics from the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics at the University of Rostock. Very familiar with Argonne. Uh, he spent 2000, 1999 and 2000 here on a fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and continues to publish articles in collaboration with researchers in our own physics division. He's a member of the German Physical Society and the Internal Science Policy Committee for the National Research Center at Russia's Kurchatov Institute. Please join me uh, with a warm Argonne rec rec welcome for uh, Professor uh, Schmidt. Thank you. Thanks for coming back. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you for the invitation that I have the opportunity to introduce the Forschungszentrum Mülich, very nicely pronounced. Thank you, the Forschungszentrum Mülich, uh, here to you. And um, as you said, I come back as a friend. I had a great time here as a postdoc uh, in the group of Craig Roberts. And uh, since then, I have been here many times, and I'm glad to be back and here. <clears throat> I would like to give you in the next 45, 50 minutes an overview about the research center. And uh, you have already pointed to some of the aspects that we really have in common. How to justify a national lab, <clears throat> how to justify 
a multi-programmatic center towards society, towards our financing partners. Um, as physicists, as scientists, we could make it so simple and just say, you know, we create knowledge, etc. Yeah, but uh, it is more difficult nowadays. It is more difficult in the U.S. and also more difficult in Europe and in Germany. Here you see the map of Germany. Jülich is on the far west with the research center. You have mentioned already the Helmholtz Association as one of the largest research organizations in, in Europe. Um, we have 18 national labs, Helmholtz centers in Germany. Some you know, of course, like uh, DAISY, like the GSI, but also the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar Research belongs to the Helmholtz Association or the German Cancer Center. Altogether, there are 18 centers, about 40,000 staff members, and an annual budget of about 4 billion euro. Maybe this uh, graph is interesting for you. The overall funding in Germany is 75 billion euro in research, while two-thirds is uh, covered by industry, paid by industry and industry research. And the remaining third is then split half at university and half, half in non-university research uh, alliances, such as uh, the Helmholtz. <clears throat> the structure of the Helmholtz centers is not that the funding goes in every individual center. The funding is so that we have structured ourselves in research fields to give it a certain focus. And within these six research fields, we then have programs. And in these programs, not only Ulich contributes, but also, for instance, in research and matter, DAISY, GSI, and others, so that we join forces and uh, spend the money on common interesting questions. Jülich contributes to the research field. Key technology here in the program is decoding the human brain, uh, soft metaphysics, supercomputing, and big data, in bioeconomy and in future information technology, and in some policy advice. In the energy research field, uh, we contribute to all four options, to energy efficiency, to nuclear fusion, to waste management, but also, of course, to renewable energies. In Earth and Environment, we have a focus on atmospheric and climate research and terrestrial environment. Matter, the structure of matter, is uh, one of the uh, most important research fields for the national labs with large-scale facilities. And here, Jülich is contributing on all four programs, from matter to materials and life, matter and universe, and matter and technology. There are two more research fields in Helmholtz, transport and space and health, where Jülich is not active. This is our <clears throat> science uh, campus in Jülich. It looks uh, like every national lab worldwide. We have a lot of forest. Uh, it's green and somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But when you have been to Jülich, you know it's close to Aachen, it's close to Cologne, and one can still have a nice time apart from good science to do. We have about uh, 6,000 staff members now, one third is scientists. Um, maybe it's interesting for you to see that we have more than 800 PhD students every year on our campus, about half is paid by Jülich, the other half is paid by the universities nearby. The annual budget is more than 600 million euro. Um, it's comparable to Oak Ridge and to Argonne, and you know what this means. It's not to, to demonstrate you know how big we are. It means a lot of responsibility, first of all, and in the next minutes I try to give you an idea uh, what we spent uh, the money for. We have an institute structure in Jülich ranging around the Helmholtz programs, so for complex systems, an institute for neutron science, the Peter Grünberg Institute for Nanoelectronics, an institute for neuroscience and medicine, our supercomputing center, an institute for advanced simulation, an institute for nuclear physics, and then the Biogeoscience, Energy and Climate Research Institutes, and central divisions for engineering, electronics, and analytics. Sometimes. Politics wants that we summarize our mission just in one sentence. It is very difficult, but we have to do it. And I come up with research for generic key technologies of the next generation. Uh, it means that we have a very strong physics program, a very strong competence in physics. And coming from this competence, we drive three applications, basically energy and environmental research, health research, and information technology. We try to develop generic key technologies, and we do it not for this generation. This is a task of industry. We do it for next generation. This graph shows you the map of Nordrhein-Westphalia. Uh, here you see Germany again. That's our uh, country. And uh, here you see the universities in Nordrhein-Westphalia and the numbers in this red 
circles uh, tell you how many joint professorships we have with these universities. Strategically, this is very important for us that we have this very strong collaboration. It is good for us. We have access to students, uh, additional to the joy of teaching, of course. And uh, it's also good for the universities. They have access to complex infrastructure. They have access to large-scale facilities. And we can work hand in hand. So every institute director in Jülich is at the same time appointed professor at one of these universities. <clears throat> With Aachen, you have seen we have in particular many, uh, 45 professorships. And here we have uh, went a very special way. We have founded the so-called Jülich Aachen Research Alliance, where we did not make a merger of university and research center as what done in Karlsruhe. We said that we focus on science, so we merge only in the scientific areas. And right now we have six different sections where we merge. This is high performance computing, this is forcer and meta experiments, brain research, soft matter research, energy research, and future information technology. This makes us much stronger. It's not only a trick, it's not only something you know we do uh, to, to play the game for getting funding. Just to give you an example, if somebody is hired in Aachen or in Jülich, and we can give him certain resources and maybe can give him a certain salary, then the university can top it. And also we can top the offer of the university so that together we are really stronger. Um, but also in other questions, soft questions like dual career, etc., we can really support uh, the appointments uh, of each other uh, to get the best heads in the world. We, uh, talent management is key for Jülich. So we support uh, early career scientists and young people in, in four lines. And this is uh, outstanding young investigator groups, for instance, postdoc programs and uh, independent groups. We, um, in particular, try to promote students and postgraduates. Um, we try to uh, give uh, them a certain career path, but also offering, for instance, vocational training um, that we offer dual career study courses and other measures. And we start early, and we even have a kindergarten in our campus, and we have a school lab where every day 100 uh, students come and get interested in uh, material science and natural sciences. What are our products? Um, of course, publications is the main result. Here you see the numbers in Jülich, but you also see that this is a triangle. And coming from basic research and publications, we go over patents, technology transfer projects, prototype, and once in a while we have spin-offs and products. And frankly speaking, uh, I'm not happy with this. I think there could be more. This is some, you have mentioned it. This is something which is also from the cultural point of view not so simple to implement. Yeah? We can encourage the scientists and say, why don't you dare to make a spin-off? Why don't you dare to found your own enterprise? But uh, being in Germany, being in this very, very nice uh, uh, security system, uh, what you have, it is a hard step for somebody to say, I renegotiate my contract with a publicly funded research center and go my own veins on high risk. So here, I, would, I can only speak for Germany and Jülich, but here we have to go more intelligent ways to support really young careers also outside science, giving them maybe a bridge or an opportunity to come back later. And we speak about Jülich, we also speak about participation in uh, large-scale projects, um, for instance, the European Spallation Source, the facility for antipoton and ion research in Darmstadt, uh, the Munich Research Reactor, the Grenoble Research Reactor, the reactor here in the US in Oak Ridge, uh, but also our um, collaborations we have in the area of uh, supercomputing. With US institutions, we have traditionally a very good and close relation, uh, of course, with Argon, me personally, but also others. Supercomputing is one example. Energy research is another one. We have a strong relation to the BLL. Uh, we have a contract with Oak Ridge and also on the West Coast. For instance, we have joint appointments with Stanford University, uh, with Lawrence Rivermore National Lab in Berkeley, or with the Allen Institute of Brain Research in the frame of the blue brain and the big brain. Craig Roberts, I mentioned already, my dear friend. He received uh, two years ago uh, the so-called Helmholtz International Fellow Award. Um, there have been only awarded 10 Helmholtz um, awards. 
uh, for two years, and uh, Craig was one of it. This was when he got his certificate in Jülich, and that gives him the possibility also to do some research in Jülich. Um, yeah, I'm back in Argonne. This was 16 years ago. That is me. <laughs> this is my little daughter, Greta, and maybe she turns a scientist somewhere. This was made in our, her last uh, flight to the Mars, and <laughs> Uh, she was back in Chicago last year, and I have shown her all places where, where she has been as baby already. Jülich addressing the grand challenges. I would like to say a few words on the budget. You have seen the four research fields, and that's how the budget uh, goes. We have in key technology about half of our budget. Uh, one quarter is in energy research, and the remaining quarter is uh, between structure and matter and earth and environment. We have uh, generic key technologies. We have a toolkit of different methods that we use. You said that we have a synchrotron. Actually, we have not. Um, what is a pity. <laughs> but we have high-performance computing. We make research with neutrons, with electrons, and with photons. Um, here we use the synchrotrons at DAISY, at BESI, in Grenoble, and also a beamline here in Argonne. Key technology is my first example, supercomputing and uh, simulation science. We have actually a dual strategy. On the one hand, uh, we push highly scalable, scalable systems, of course, with Uqueen that we have right now has about six uh, petaflop um, as a capacity. And we have, on the other hand, general purpose computer, cluster computing, and uh, here we have the 300 uh, teraflop system. And soon we will upgrade both systems uh, so that we can play in the league we would like to play, and here we have a strong uh, relation to Oak Ridge and to Argon, and I think this is necessary given the uh, competition we all feel from the Asian side. I guess it is uh, very important that we work together and hand in hand in the questions of software of algorithms and also of hardware development. Going now from the petaflop scale to the exa, exa scale is a big step to go. We have a major effort in this area. Here in the center, you see our so-called simulation laboratories. Um, we, we found that this is really a problem, having on the one hand this hardware, these one million cores that can be used at the same time, and then we have a user uh, community which is saying, you know, this goes too fast. We don't have the experience uh, to use these kind of computers. Therefore, we have found uh, so-called simulation labs. You see this is community-wise. And in every community, there are then, for instance, neuroscientists, and they work together with uh, people from informatics so that they are able to scale their programs and to understand the results and even to visualize the results together with these colleagues. It is a certain attempt to do it, yeah? One can always say maybe you get them out of your, their usual field and they get more and more people from informatics or the other way around. But our first experience with these simulation labs is very good. And then, of course, we have this cross-sectional teams um, with all the applications necessary. There is the big data coming up. Now it's relatively small on this transparency. I guess in the future we need to draw it more bigger. We meet the big data challenge almost every day in all different communities, for ranging from medicine up to the nice AMS experiment in, on the space station. And the human brain, it's an astonishing computer itself. You know these numbers. Um, this compares with Watson. I just want to make the point that the computers we have now do this with about 2 to 5 megawatt, and the brain does obviously the same uh, with 25 watt. Uh, so when we speak about the, the step from petaflop to exascale computing, we cannot speak about uh, megawatt uh, to gigawatt. This is impossible. So here the main challenge is how to make uh, processors and storage of today and tomorrow less electricity consuming. Um, and there's a lot to learn maybe from the brain. We have this connection in Jülich between brain research and supercomputing. So we put the brain with its pathways on a supercomputer and this is, then it's possible to learn a lot about singleton pathways about how the, the brain works. But on the other hand, maybe we can work, uh, we can learn how the brain works when it comes to electricity uh, consumption and other uh, interesting issues. So this is a big project, not only in Jülich, there's a so-called uh, human brain project in Europe where many, many labs work together. And the, the goal is in the next five to 10 years uh, to uh, put forward uh, the brain research, not only in structure, but also, also in function. Here you see uh, some 
of the results in Jülich. Um, of the, this is a so-called fiber tracking and decoding the human brain. I will come back to that in a second. Maybe one more word for uh, motivation of the brain research. And this transparency shows how many lives, life years we will lose due to what kind of diseases uh, in the next years. And you see everything which is yellow has to do with diseases of the brain. So it is really important to better understand the structure and the function of the brain. Um, and I'm, I was surprised to see, I thought that a cancer or others uh, might be on top of it, but that's no longer the case. In Jülich, we do a lot of basic research and brain research. We also do clinical uh, research, but this we certainly do with the hospitals in Aachen, in Cologne, in Bonn, and in Düsseldorf. And then we make a lot of uh, technology development, the connection to high performance computing, but also nuclear chemistry and a lot of uh, neuroimaging. What we try to do is we would try to understand the brain on a molecular, on a cellular level, but then to go all this way along also to understand the connectivity at the end and even uh, cognitive properties. We have a big system of different imaging techniques. We have three Tesla MRT devices, but also 9.4 Tesla device combined with a PET, which is unique in the world. Um, we do have a lot of animal scanners. We develop our own tracers. And uh, here we work also together with the hospitals to get access to patients. In the future, and this is new, and I have mentioned it already, there comes this combination and all this what we have with the supercomputing and the big data analysis group. Why making a new brain? Why making this new brain? Why trying to understand that? Um, Maybe you're not aware of the fact that the brain map that is used now in hospitals is about 100 years old. It's from Brodmann. It's very useful, but of course we have new possibilities now. So when we speak about uh, our imaging method, then we come up at the end with such a three-dimensional model of the human brain. Here you see even this color coding. When you make finger tapping, then these are the uh, brain areas uh, that work, and this is called the so-called U-brain, the Jülich brain, and if you go to our internet pages, you can load it down and surf a little bit in this uh, generalized uh, human brain with your children. Here comes again this uh, fiber tracking. Actually, it should be a movie. Yes, here you go. Um, with a certain technique where you uh, use uh, polarization, uh, you can uh, make these nice pictures. Different colors mean that these are vectors in the brain going in different directions. So these are exactly the fibers that connect the neurons. And uh, with the method we have developed, you can see you can go very, very deeply into the human brain. You can see details that haven't seen before. And this help us, or helps us to understand really the so-called connectome. So how Function-wise, does the hern, does the brain uh, work? We combine MRT with a PET. Uh, just to remind you, the first uh, PET pictures have been shot on mice in CERN in uh, 1977. You see, these have been the pictures at that time. Now it looks a little better. Today we have uh, pictures like these from the human brain, where in particular uh, uh, tumors and other are normal uh, things are easy to identify. And we combine these PET uh, pictures with MRT pictures. Here you see our famous 9.4 Tesla. Uh, it's really a, a big one. And uh, so, but we got the ethic vote, so humans are in this MRT right now, and it is not dangerous, and it gives us new insight into the brain. Here you see a three Tesla uh, picture of the hippocampus, for instance, and here 9.4. Uh, picture. I'm not a medical doctor, but the um, ratio of signal to noise is obviously much better in this uh, figure than it is in that figure. I'd now like to come to uh, biosoft and soft matter studies. Here we would uh, go in three, three ways. On the one hand, fundamental research with colloids, uh, polymers, and this area, and then structural biology, in particular protein folding, uh, protein uh, structure and uh, dynamics and then we would like to understand the physics of the cell. Just to give you one example, again, as application already, um, this is a novel approach uh, to Alzheimer. Usually it is believed that the a, 
uh, beta monomers are responsible for building at the end the plaques related to Alzheimer in the brain and medication goes to suppress these monomers but actually the monomers itself are important for the brain and if you suppress them, a lot of side effects um, appear. What is toxic are the oligomers who, under, who uh, develop under certain circumstances from these monomers. So they are toxic, so here we need to start the therapy. And the results that we have are very, very uh, promising. In animals it works, plux goes back actually. And uh, so we have a, right now a so-called validation project where we got three million euro to further explore diagnostic and therapy. <coughs> The uh, understanding the physics of the cell, understanding the physics of life. Here's an example of how we make out of sugar finally our energy with the help of neutron scattering. Uh, we have uh, been able to trace back this prote protein behavior where you see the enzymes and how they work, how their um, dynamics is, and in uh, this dynamics mean different energy states, and in doing so somehow uh, we got into this PGAK uh, mechanism to produce uh, the energy out of the sugar. So structure, function, and dynamics is uh, very important, and all these three things can be done with neutron research. Now I'd like to come to nanoscience and information technology. Energy saving is something what I have already pointed out. It's very important, and also, you know, the Energiewende in Deutschland, the change in our energy policy made us uh, to make much more towards energy research than before, and also in the uh, field of IT. It's therefore, that we do a lot for uh, green IT. Um, in production, power grids, cars, household appliance, and others, uh, I don't have to entertain this chart here. It is clear that the electric power consumption due to IT is going to increase over the next years, and here we have to try with our research to positively influence these curves. Um, maybe just one transparency, uh, as a colloquium transparency, if we make a Google research, of course, uh, this means that servers start to work somewhere in the world, and it, that costs a lot of energy. Huh? We all tell our children to turn off the light when, we, when they leave the room, but we would never tell them, think twice before you Google. Uh, somehow, we are not really aware of this problem. Yeah? Uh, but if you make a quick and dirty calculation with one Google search, uh, you could power a 100 watt light bulb for 11 seconds. You could uh, create enough carbon dioxide to fill one thirds of a, a soda can, etc. If you sum up all monthly Google searches, then you see on these numbers, this is really impressive. Uh, so one should really think about, of course we need to Google, I'm not trying to say not to do it. Uh, <laughs> but we as researchers, yeah, we need to see how can we do this uh, less electricity cons consuming. This is really something uh, what is also politicians do not really discover right now and use for their argumentation. So we know that uh, the CMOS technology is driving um, uh, information technology over the last decades. We know, on the other hand, there is the end of the Moore's law. So we would like to make more out of the Moore's law, of course, to push it to its limits. On the other hand, we need to do much more than more. Uh, here we need to have alternative approaches and we go these ways in quantum systems and spin-based systems, but also in bioelectronic interfaces and try to uh, get better than the CMOS technology. Thank you for mentioning Peter Grunberg. <laughs> I do the same, of course. Um, but uh, I will not speak about the physics, but maybe about this transparency. Uh, something, this uh, innovation chain is difficult to address. And politicians always tell us you have to do faster, you know, two years, three years, and then we need to see a product. I think the Grunberg invention and Albert Fair was very fast. There was a famous paper, 88, and 10 years later he entered the market um, with this system. It was 10 years. Politicians can say 10 years is too long, but we all know this was really a successful. This was a fundamental science paper. Yeah, and then IBM took over, somehow we worked together, and so only 10 years later this was dominating the world market. So my message is 10 years is okay for labs like for basic research. Don't say that in Jülich. <laughs> um, Jülich is famous for high resolution electron microscopy, in particular, aberration corrected system, spatial and chromatic. And we have the Pico device, which is the uh, uh, most powerful microscope in the world. And here we have a 50 picometer resolution. We have a 
entire set of different uh, TEMS uh, microscopes, and uh, you see this is fantastic new possibilities in material research um, from fundamental aspect, but also then when it comes to energy materials uh, for renewable energy for photovoltaics, for instance. Energy research, we have about 80 million euro in, invested in, in Jülich per year. Um, just to remind you that we are privileged, yeah? This is the birth of Jesus Christ, and there was no oil available, and then somehow we live in golden times of oil, and we profit from it, all the economical growth is connected with it. Um, but somehow for the history of mankind, it's all, only an episode. It's a data function if I choose a scale differently. Uh, so we profit from this, but on the other hand, we have the responsibility to replace it. And uh, well, as a German, I think about my nice car. I'd like to have a nice noise. I'd like to have you know, a, a good functioning engine. But that's not the problem. We know already there are alternative fuels. The problem is chemical products. 75% of all chemical products are made from oil plastic bags, etc., etc., And we just got another 100 years to replace all of that with alternative concepts. This is a challenge for science. This is something we have to do together. For instance, <coughs> we use algae uh, to produce jet fuel, uh, kerosene. Here you see these algae. They uh, eat kohlen dioxide, which we get from the power plants nearby. And then this grows very quickly, and we can make alternative fuel out of it. Uh, so at least for this case, to close this loop and say um, we can replace uh, the normal kerosene, we could have an alternative approach. Craig, you know where this stands? This is in front of the nuclear physics building where they chopped all the nice trees away. Uh, just in brackets. Um, we have a strong focus on new energy material itself. Here we have uh, got funding for the Helmholtz Energy Materials Characterization Platform. Um, where we have an entire set of different uh, instrumentation and we go for catalysis, for electrochemistry, and for other phenomena. Um, here there are about 800 scientists involved in energy research in, in Jülich. So Jülich and Karlsruhe are the big laboratories for energy research in Germany and perhaps even in uh, Europe. In Earth and Environment, uh, we um, have an integrated approach. Um, here you see, uh, for instance, what is the inference on groundwater, on cloud, and uh, what does that mean then for the farmers, for the land here. Um, this is an approach which requires a lot of measurements on the ground in the earth. And this is done in Jülich together with universities with an entire set of different uh, laboratories. And um, another question that we have is the chemistry-climate interaction. Here we know that there's a lot of pollution in the air going on. How can we monitor these and how can we understand the processors? For instance, there are little devices on the body of airplanes. Uh, from Jülich, we have contracts with United Airlines, with China Airlines, with Lufthansa and others, and they fly all day around the world and they take all the data and then they send them down to Jülich and here we try to understand what are the processes for the pollution, etc., so that we be better prepared in case of a breakout of the Eierfalla Jökull, my famous volcanoes from Iceland, next time. Uh, so here we uh, try to understand what it is and how we can uh, support with our systems predictions later. Um, this shows a simulation. Um, here there is a, a lot of uh, forest burning in South America. And so we measure the data and we look to the processes, how they move in the upper atmosphere uh, around the world. The results that we have enter the famous reports. And uh, here, Jülich has really a unique uh, selling point in Germany within the research centers. Structure of matter. I'd like to start with the Institute of uh, Nuclear Physics. Here you see the cooler synchrotron uh, COSI, where we accelerate uh, protons and deuterons um, up to an energy of 3.7 GeV. Uh, GeV. Um, in Jülich, we are experts in particular in the cooling processes. This is electron cooling and stochastic cooling on the other hand. And we share this expertise with uh, many labs all over the world. And uh, certainly the future that we see here um, is also the facility for antiproton and iron research in Darmstadt, which is going to be built and Jülich is a strong partner of this collaboration. We are happy about it. On the other hand, it means for the COSI, for the cooler synchrotron, that 
you know, certainly we have to shut it down. We have already finished all the operation for users in Hadron Physics by the end of uh, last year. Uh, so the detectors that we have, the Vasa detector, Anke and Toff, they are closed. Uh, the users, they finish their results um, uh, by publishing the results, but we will not restart uh, this program because uh, in the strategy that we have, and we started that eight years ago, this was now the beginning of the FAIR project. Uh, you know, this is delayed, so it's a little bit of pity for our scientists uh, that we suffer from this delay uh, since our decisions have been done and uh, one should not reactivate that then after these tough discussions we had anyway with it. <clears throat> what is uh, the background of the Hadron physics at COSI? Um, you know, there are these three quark states, baryons, we have the quark anti-state uh, mesons, um, we found the dibaryon and we are going to uh, study the tetraquark system. And these are things that gives us a very nice finish for COSI physics so that we can proudly say it was a successful program over, over 10 years and we have very nice results even at the end. What is the future? The future is in Jülich that we would try to uh, understand uh, better um, the obviously uh, missing of antimatter that we would like to enter this field of uh, studying CP violation. And I'm sure you know this cartoon, uh, somehow matter meets antimatter after the Big Bang. There's a big fight and there's a winner, and the winner is matter, or not, who knows? So we have a two-fold strategy here. On the um, one hand, of course, maybe there is hidden antimatter somewhere in the universe. And here we work in the Jülich Aachen Research Alliance together with our colleagues in Aachen at this so-called AMS uh, detector in uh, at the space station. Uh, boy, we spoke about this morning over breakfast about this. And uh, maybe there is more antimatter than we can see, and the first results are very promising that we have. Now you could ask, what has Jülich to do with it? Uh, the reason is the following. All the data they take, they are then uh, transferred to Jülich, and on our supercomputer we calculate these results regarding big data, but also HPC. And that's a very uh, successful collaboration we have, and we are, we are glad to join with our colleagues in Aachen uh, this nice project. On the other hand, maybe there is symmetry breaking. Um, maybe uh, all antimatter disappeared because of the symmetry breaking, and then elementary particles should have an electric uh, dipole moment. And here we suggest a new accelerator. We suggest a project to measure the EDM of a proton and of a deuteron. In Jülich, we would like to do this in collaboration. We have a strong collaboration with Brookhaven National Lab. Um, they have similar plans. Um, it's a question of an all-in-one uh, accelerator or an all-electric ring or whatsoever, but these uh, we work out. And the deputy, uh, the deputy director for accelerator research, uh, Professor Mai Bai, um, just entered Jülich, so she is now the new institute director in Jülich. So already by this personal relation, we have a, a very good bridge between Jülich and uh, Brookhaven. <coughs> yeah, this is the um, ADM, what we would like to see. Um, it's, a, it's a new ring, so we cannot take COSI. That's a, a disadvantage. We will use the COSI ring for the next five years to make a precursor experiment and to show that it is possible to flip all spins of the proton and the deuteron in one direction and then to drive the ring in a so-called uh, frozen spin mode and to see if that works. We get a precision of 10 to the minus 25 with a cozy installation, but we know we need 10 to the minus 29. Yeah? So this is four orders of magnitude and therefore we need a new accelerator. Um, we estimate the budget less than 100 million euro. Um, I hope that will turn out. Still, you can believe me, it is very difficult when I explain that to politicians that I would like to measure A0 and that costs about 100 million. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not so, it's not so simple to argue, you know, that then we come up with the story of the existence of mankind and anti-matter, et cetera. But this is, and you would have the same here in the US, it's a prioritization process. We need to make the scientific case very, very good. We need to prepare it very good. And I'm glad that I could reserve the money for the next five years to make these precursor experiments, to really make a proof of concept, to show if we get the money, we could do it. Yeah? That is the status for this project right now. Um, the FAIR project I have already mentioned. 
Um, here, this is the COSI, then this is uh, the GSI. Um, here you see the high energy storage rank, and this is the ZIS 100, and Hulich builds 100% this uh, high energy storage rank. So we have now uh, major parts already in Hulich, and when they are finished, when they are tested, etc., we ship them to Darmstadt, and then the installation uh, will start. Here at this uh, place, there we will have the so-called Panda experiment for QCD, probing, for instance, glue balls and others. This is a collaboration of more than 500 scientists from 15 different countries, and Jülich holds here a part of about 10% uh, of these activities. So FAIR, here you see it again, is therefore for us a very major point in developing uh, detectors in Jülich, in developing, for instance, pellet targets to develop different other things where we have expertise uh, due to our Hadron Physics and Accelerator uh, Physics program over the years. Um, we will uh, make a new installation of an electron cooler. Um, here you see the electron cooler in Jülich. It is a uh, two mega electron volt cooler for the final version of FAIR. We will need an eight mega electron volt cooler. Already the, the two mega electron volt is really a challenge. It's by a factor of 10 uh, higher power than the one at the GSI right now. As we do this together with the Budka Institute in Novosibirsk, where you also have a strong relation to. I would now like to come in the area of structure of matter to uh, do research with neutrons. Um, when it comes to neutrons, um, we have a lot of expertise in Jülich. Like 40 years ago, small angle neutron scattering was invented in Jülich, was developed all the years with our own uh, research reactors. The last research reactor we had, the DIDO, was turned off uh, not 10 years ago. That was a very bad moment in time, of course, when you have to say goodbye to such a nice facility. But as always, you can lift new challenges, you can lift new chances, and here the possibility was given to us and to build uh, 14 new instruments for the research reactor in Munich, in Bavaria, and we took this opportunity, and now half of the operation in Munich is in Jülich hands and open for, of course, national users as a, a user facility. What we try with the instrumentations that we have to cover um, a lot of orders of magnitude here in space from picometer up to micrometer, and here you see the different instruments we have coming from the diffractometer, reflectometer, small angle scattering, but also reflectometer Maria in Munich uh, to give different uh, signs, communities the possibility to do um, their measurements. And the same in time, from picoseconds up to microseconds, uh, here famous is the spin echo. Um, this spin echo installation is the only non-American instrument at the spallation neutron source in Oak Ridge, is the Jülich uh, spin echo. We operate this with a team of about 10 people, and we learn a lot about megawatt spallation sources, and when we enter the European spallation source, we of course profit uh, from the experience we have gained there. In the beginning, it was a little tough. Yeah? The spin echo measurement takes like two or three weeks, and the user is impatient, and so you cannot serve so many users per year. It means you do not publish so many publications per year. But these are complex, um, in, uh, complex experiments, and uh, as long as the output is excellent, I don't care, then it's okay. And this has much improved over the years. Neutron research is a very special thing in Europe right now. Um, they are basically under pressure, the nuclear reactors, because of post-Fukushima. There was a lot of refurbishment necessary after Fukushima, and this was very expensive, and it was questioned um, um, what the scientific case is. So we wrote a strategy paper for Germany and for Europe, uh, with the authors given here, with the neutron strategy. And uh, basically what it is is that uh, we need a hierarchy of different sources. We need, of course, the flagships in Grenoble, but we also need national uh, facilities. Here you see a map. Hülich is active at the ILL. We are associated and have three instruments. We have these 14 instruments in Munich. We have one instrument at the spallation source in Oak Ridge. We will contribute to the European spallation source. Um, we have collaboration contracts with the car reactor in China and with the Chinese spallation neutron source. Actually, last week I have been there. It is really impressive. It's basically finished. Yeah? Uh, so they will have first neutrons in a year from now. So this is really amazing how quick they move. Um, can only congratulate them. 
Our strategy is best instruments at the best sources in the world. Of course, we would like to have our own source. Uh, Jülich has applied for a national spallation source 30 years ago, has applied for a European spallation source 15 years ago, and we have a long history in not getting a spallation source. But we are glad that now in Europe there uh, we will have the European spallation source and um, Germany uh, contributes to the construction and Jülich is the main contributor, so Jülich has a project management and we are the uh, leading lab. I'm a member of the steering committee of the ESS myself. So Germany will contribute to the instrumentation, uh, Jülich, Gestacht and the Technical University. DAISY may be contributing to the accelerator and for the target, uh, Jülich will contribute Dresden Rossendorf and the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Altogether, uh, Germany will give 220 million euro of our, as our contribution for the construction of the ESS, which is a lot of money. Yeah. Um, we try to build six instruments, and uh, if we have six instruments, then it would be like 25% of the instrumentation at ESS and would give Germany a strong position in this uh, project. These are the partner countries, you know, it's just in Sweden and Lund. And uh, in the construction phase, Sweden and Denmark pay 50%. Uh, Germany has a share of 11% and France 10% and uh, Great Britain also 11% and then smaller contributions. In how far we will then finance the operational cost is not clear by now. This is an open question and as you know, project management always tries to push this in the future. Yeah, so at the end, somebody will pay. I see this relatively critical. This is really not solved and this is going to be an issue we will deal with over the next uh, years. Groundbreaking was in October 2014. And uh, at the end, I'd like to say a few words in our collaboration with uh, Russia. Here you see the peak reactor complex in Gatchina. This is going to be a 100 megawatt peak reactor, which is amazing. Yeah? But, uh, Grenoble, just to remind you, has uh, 57 megawatt. So here this can be a very nice incident that at the end, in maybe 10 years from now, Europe has a new facility, a 100 megawatt reactor, and just, you know, just next to our big cities. I'm saying this because I, because I don't believe that we get another research reactor in Western Europe. Yeah, we will have Grenoble, this will have another 15 years, uh, but then I don't think that will be built again. And so for us, it is strategically important to help Russia to develop a fully fledged user facility that we have maybe in 15 years from now enough neutrons in the right quality. That's why we engage and that's why Putin uh, likes it, what we do. This is Helmut Dosche and myself. I saw him and I knew this must have somehow a difficult end. We could grant the political asylum to conduct their research here. So Putin had invited Dosche and me to move to Russia. <laughs> I, I said no, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so from a strategic point of view, this transparency again, we are now here. The reactor in Berlin will be closed down in 2020. ILL will be operated until 2030, maybe. We will then have an operating European spallation source. We will have a Munich reactor as a national source. And perhaps the peak reactor could solve many problems in neutron research then in Europe if we support them and help them uh, already today. So my last transparency, I show another technology transfer project. And this is a cleaning agent uh, which is now uh, sold in most of our home stores, department stores, or how to call. This, uh, the furniture manufacturer is Clue, and you see the logo of Forschungszentrum Jülich. Um, this is not toxic, actually. It works uh, with the addition of some polymers, and therefore is a very nice breakthrough for this kind of uh, research, and this is how they promote it in the stores. And I like it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. This is a picture from the school lab in Jülich, and that is my daughter. Thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, would you entertain a few questions? Of course. Well, I'll take the first one, I guess. Uh, you, you talked about the, the institution's uh, role in brain research, but what's, what's the the European strategy, and what's the total budget for brain mapping research? 
So the, uh, we have the so-called, we have two flagship programs fund financed by, by Europe. One is on graphene and the other is on the human brain. And both are about 1 billion euro. Wow. But over 10 years and for many labs. So on the one hand, we are happy to have so much funding for brain research as a joint concerted approach. On the other hand, you know, I, sometimes I think it is better to have only a few labs who get the money. If, if you spread that too broad, then everybody gets five PhD positions more, and strategically you don't change anything. Of course you do more research then, but you don't really have a strategic change somewhere. Um, so we are glad about the funding, and, uh, but there's also a lot of coordination because of the many labs with all the problems going along with it. I was quite impressed with your number of students you have in Yuli. You have shown something like 814 students or something. Are some of them sandwich programs that are coming part of the time to do their education? Or uh, what, is, what are the mechanisms that you are able to recruit so many mm. students? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, Jülich is not allowed to issue degrees. So we are not allowed to issue PhD degrees. So every student we have at the end gets the PhD at the university. So that means he needs a supervisor at the university and in the research center. And then there are some PhD students that are really on the Jülich payroll. So they are sitting all day in Jülich. Maybe they get some courses at the university, uh, but basically they are in, in Jülich. And then there are these sandwich programs where students are at the university, for instance, and then they can use, for instance, for half a year the electron microscope, and then they go back to the university. And we also have international exchange programs where uh, during their three years of PhD, the students come for a year or for half a year to Jülich or the other way around. Here we are flexible, and we try to make possible every, everything what is good for the student. So I have a question. You mentioned in Jülich you're trying to get more technology out into the market. So how easy is it for a company to come into the research center in Jülich and how, how do you work with them? Yeah. So first of all, I, we need to create a win-win situation. Yeah? So it is not acceptable for industry that they pay and we do basic research and enjoy ourselves. But it's also not acceptable for us when industry comes and was just like to take over and go home with some results. Yeah? So here it is usually a question of tough negotiations. We have had problems in the past, and uh, here one has to see the interest of both sides and try to understand it. Yeah? But just to mention one problem, yeah? we had a very nice result during a PhD thesis financed by industry, and it is German law that if you defend your PhD thesis, you have to make it public for four weeks. And then the industry said, no, you don't make it public. Uh, you can wait another five years and then, and, but this is of course not acceptable. Yeah? And these problems we know now and we negotiate beforehand. In general, um, we have good experience with so-called innovation labs. If you really invite industry for a longer term collaboration. For instance, with IBM, we have an exascale innovation lab. The IBM spon sponsors six positions, we sponsor six positions. So these are the 12 positions, very strong group working on exascale computing. So, so if I read your slide right, about two-thirds of the funding is actually from industry? And yeah, this is not, it's not Jülich. It is in, it, German industry uh, spends so much money in German industry. Right. So this is money we don't see, um, but this is BASF, this is Bosch, and this is the chemical industry and automobile industry doing basic research th themselves. So how does that, so that doesn't flow directly into Jülich? It, no. It's, okay. No, it doesn't. It is, but I've been to countries where the number is zero from industry research. <laughs> so I find it quite impressive having this responsibility in the German industry. Um, Sebastian, are you in a position to give us a realistic assessment of when uh, FAIR will be completed and operational? Excuse me? FAIR? When? When will it be completed and operational? Um, Eight years from now, that's what they say, 23. I, you have heard already a little bit, you know, I made a, such a nice tragedy for Jülich that being in time and budget with our cozy program and then fully take responsibility for our contribution to FAIR, and now we have finished our program, we make everything for FAIR, but actually we are too early. 
And what I said was not true. We are not finishing the components now, ship them to Darmstadt to install. We finish, we ship to Darmstadt, and I had to um, hire a big hall to store it, which is expensive and not nice. <laughs> Yeah, you see, it is, it's not pleasant with the FAIR project. We got, just had a big review, and this was again said that this is very important physics, and there's a very important physics case in it, and, but uh, we also got an alarm that one has to take all actions from all sides to get the management uh, in the way it should be done for such a billion euro project. Continuing a little bit along the same lines, um, you mentioned Europe, you mentioned co collaborations in Europe and so on, but also collaborations with China, Russia, things like that. Evidently, the problems that you encounter, you set for Europe, for example, many institutions and so on, how does one get, what's your feeling about getting this to work well, which probably means simpler than the agreements you have right now? You mean the large projects? For example. Yeah, uh, I think that in particular with these large-scale projects, one has to be careful. Um, ten years ago, I met somebody in the U.S. and I told him about the idea of XFL and FAIR, that this is a multi-European project of 15, 18 countries, and I sold it as a big success. Look, Europe is strong, you know, this is what we can do. He told me, young man, be careful. If you want to kill a project, internationalize it. I said, huh? <laughs> What is he saying? <laughs> and 10 years later, I know what he means. Uh, so I think collaboration is important, but responsibility should be not to be shared by too many people at the end. Uh, so somebody has to have the strong management in, in their own hand. Otherwise, if you have to re negotiate everything with 15 partners, it can be a pain in the neck. Not on the scientific basis. Collaboration is important, and the big questions are clear that we have to go towards Asia, we have to go with America and Europe together. The energy problem, for instance, we have to share resources, data, observation. This is clear and maybe can be done in a more structured way, in particular involving young investigators. I have the feeling many projects are on top level, but a memorandum of understanding are signed, I do the same, but then they are only for the Hall of Fame and nothing happens. You need people who do the research at the end. Here we have to put more incentives into it and not on the basis I pay one PhD student here and they pay one there. This is not enough strategically, nothing will change by that. So here we have to define maybe three to five really big areas of research, making a focus program and open it international. The research model uh, in um, US is somewhat different from what you have. You have two third funding kind of from the industry. So does that get you into problem, helps you, or uh, how do you compare both the research uh, setups in US and in Europe? I wouldn't say it is so, so, uh, so, so different. And of course, in some aspects, uh, you have different decision procedures for money, and uh, money aspects, you have another way of evaluating, but th at the end, it is, it is the same. U US goes for excellent projects with strategic relevance exactly the same we do in Germany. Uh, we would like to have excellent science supported with high relevance. And, um, and also, I guess, the recommendation that non-university university institutions should work together with universities. This is also something you learn every day. And so I wouldn't say it is too different. At least from my point of view, it is not an excuse for any uh, fruitful collaboration. We can do all together we want. The borders are not so high or too big. Is the two-third funding from the industry uh, a hard set limit that you guys have? Because sometimes industry doesn't want to do some research project. Does that limit you in any way? Yeah, it is, uh, if you make a third funding project with industry, of course you, you lose a little bit your freedom. They want to see results. They have one or two years. They are impatient and <laughs> that's the way it should be, but that's the way it is. So I think it is a balance. In Jülich, I would like to see more industry projects but I would not like to see, let's say, 50% of our budget. That would be not good for an institution like ours. Um, but I have shown you almost all examples I know with Clue and with Peter Grünberg, you know. It's not that I have another 15 on my, uh, another transparency. So here we have, I would say we could do much more with industry and also with the big industry. Uh, 
It's, it's a cultural problem. 